Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. The hit cast offers a weekly look at Hollywood from a conservative point of view. Sick of media bias infecting Hollywood headlines? Tired of stars insulting your views? Hit has your back. Now, here's your host, Christian Toto. Welcome to episode 67 of the Hollywood and Toto podcast, The Right Take on Entertainment. This week we're speaking with Jim Garrity of National Review fame. Few conservative pundits really get pop culture quite like Jim does. We broke bread recently during his trip to Colorado Springs, and I was able to grab him for a short but cool chat the next day. This week's show is sponsored by the Amy Schumer School of Movie Marketing. When you absolutely positively want to chase away half your audience, think Amy. Before my conversation with Jim, I wanted to talk about our current nostalgia cravings. Is anyone else fed up with our constant need to relive the past? My mood darkened after seeing the new movie Ready Player One, and it's not really the movie's fault. It's kind of brisk, kind of fun, uplifting at times, a real pop culture treat. Kind of movie you forget after leaving the theater, but there's no real harm in that. So why my long face? It's two plus hours of nostalgia on steroids. It's like an orgy of nostalgia. The film follows a future America where citizens escape into a virtual reality realm dubbed the Oasis. The realm's creator obsessed over the 80s, so it's filled with bric a brac from that era. Cool, right? There's even a long section, a very long section, dedicated to The Shining. Fans of that movie might absolutely love that particular part of the movie. That's all fun, right? So why did it leave the theater just feeling a little bit blue? And nostalgia is great, and I have to say the older I get, the more I feel its pull. I can just hear a song from The Breakfast Club. I get all verklempt. It's just weird. Just the last couple of years it's happening to me. I guess what's happened when you get older, it just things start to change. But in 2018, it's starting to feel like a creative crutch. Think about stuff like Stranger Things, Guardians of the Galaxy, and now Ready Player One. They all swim in 80s nostalgia, to the point where you're actually distracted from the story that's going on right in front of you. It feels cheap and lazy sometimes. And this is from someone who really grew up in the 80s, and I don't mind stepping back into that period now and then. Maybe not all the time. You know, the first season of Stranger Things really used the 80s well. Yes, it was set there. Sure, we saw some references across the storyline. But it didn't really pull us out of the experience. It just made it richer and made it more fun. And so did Guardians of the Galaxy. That first mixtape, outstanding. I loved it. But then the both projects came back, of course, with sequels and new seasons. And something was a little bit different. The, the attempts at bringing back the 80s felt a little bit more in your face, a little more forced. I mean, that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, it was just like, hey, look at what cool late 70s song we've got for you now. Well, all right, but don't announce it. Don't make it a big thing. Just weave it into the story. They didn't do that. It's one of the many reasons why I'm one of the few people who thought that movie was a real dud. Now, I wonder what the nostalgia craze says about us as a culture. You know, you can say, well, it's the storytellers doing what they do, but a lot of us are lapping it up. Why? Is it we need comfort food in our really crazy age that we're living in right now? Or is it speak to something more disturbing or is it just sort of innocent fun? I don't know. I do know I'd love to see more movies and TV shows create new memories without falling back on the old ones. Don't touch that dial. You're listening to my daddy's podcast. And now here's the celebrity tweet of the week. This week's winner is Billy Eichner. The comic actor did his darndest to shore up the bona fides of that Parkland High School activist march from a few days back. Only they might wish he stood down all the same. Here we go. After hearing the Parkland students on Saturday and seeing Angels in America on Sunday, I can confirm what I've always known. The drama club, the drama club kids will save us all. Where does one even begin with such silliness? You're listening to the Hollywood in Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. My hit tip of the week is Black Snake Moan. The film is director Craig Brewer's follow-up to the excellent hustle and flow. You know it's hard out here for a pimp. The project is different and not for the squeamish. 
Samuel L. Jackson stars as a blues guitarist who chains up a promiscuous woman, played by Christina Ricci, in his house to cure her of her philandering ways. Are, are you still with me? The film is all over the map, but it really is held together. It really is held together by Brewer's storytelling gifts. Ricci is excellent as a troubled young woman held against her will, and Jackson isn't your typical Samuel L. Jackson character. He buries some of those ticks deep in his character's soul. It's a terrific performance. Now, if that plot description scares you away, I totally get it. But if it doesn't, Black Snake Moan might just be for you. And you can watch it now on Amazon Prime. Now, let's get to my chat with Jim Garrity. Jim weighs in on the political scene at National Review, and he's excellent. If you're not following him on Twitter, not checking out his stories, well, do so right away. He's great. But he's also got a really good sense of popular culture and Hollywood and what's going on in the industry. He's smart, provocative, and keyed into the kind of cultural trends that some people miss. And I wish more right-of-center folks emulated his style. Of course, there's only, only one Jim Garrity, but I think more people can really be attuned to what's going on, comment on it, and sort of in, kind of broaden the co- cultural conversation. He also co-hosts the Jim and Mickey Show. It's a podcast that covers pop culture. What else? They do a deep dive into the latest movie and TV news. They're on a bit of a hiatus right now, but he told me they're going to be coming back pretty soon. So check that out. Maybe just listen to a few older episodes and enjoy the show. Oh, and a quick warning. I talked with Jim at a public event, so there's going to be some background noise, but I think you should be able to hear the conversation loud and clear. But that's why you're going to hear some of the uh, buzz and chatter in the background. Apologies. Here's my conversation with Jim Garrity. So, Jim, my first question is if this was like a Facebook relationship status, Hollywood and conservatives, it's complicated, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, you and I like pop culture, and yet the messages coming out of the industry it can be sort of really either angry or not just against our principles, but sort of in a more aggressive way than I've seen in my lifetime. It makes it very easy to hate Hollywood. <laughs> and, and I think we don't want to hate Hollywood. Yeah, no, I don't. I the, certainly don't. The experience of going to the movies and, and seeing a movie that you love, whether it's a, a summer blockbuster or something like that, we all have our favorite movies. There's a reason, you know, uh, I'm, I'm you know, right smack in the middle of Generation X, and, you know, I'm the kind of guy who quote Star Wars, quote Ghostbusters, quote all these, you know, you, know, um, you could probably argue this goes back to, you know, the campfire, uh, stories around the campfire of hunter-gatherers, right? We've always been uh, telling myths and legends and all kinds of stuff like that. So, this does, in fact, we're in a modern age, doesn't change any of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that you've written really kind of recognizes that. This is something we kind of need as a culture. And unfortunately, uh, the folks in charge of Hollywood who have never been um, perhaps the most sterling moral character and upstanding uh, uh, fine gentlemen and such, um, look, they, they, they very much are in a bubble. They, they very much don't encounter uh, viewpoints different to the group thing. Uh, it sounds like uh, from certain folks that they really do punish you if you deviate from that group thing. Um, and that, you know, we, we live in a world where, you know, Republican views were considered uh, extraordinarily controversial out there. But, you know, working with Harvey Weinstein, uh, Harvey, uh, Weinstein wasn't. And that's, that's, you know, like, you know, yeah. morally seems like another planet to a lot of people. Yeah, uh, let's talk about the Me Too movement sparked by sure. Harvey Weinstein. You know, I want to see change within the industry. I want to see more actresses get opportunities. I want to see less Harvey Weinstein's running amok. Are you optimistic that 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 we're moving in that direction within the Hollywood community and even maybe beyond that, or is or is this more hashtaggy than anything else? Uh, there, there's a lot of indisputably there's a lot of posing, a lot of uh, convenient uh, wearing of the label, a lot of hypocrisy and all that mm-hmm. stuff. But yeah, I. I it's been, I've been a little frustrated by the debate, particularly within conservative circles on this, in the sense that, like, <coughs> I don't think, like, if you listen to Uma Thurman, uh, who sounds like she's ready to kill somebody, uh-huh. with good reason, and, you know, probably justifiable homicide, um, and a lot of these women, I don't doubt that they're serious about wanting to stop this. And I have enough, you know, not quite shredded faith in the human condition to believe that I think there are probably some good men in Hollywood who are appalled by these kinds of yeah. stories and don't want to be a part of a... Uh, culture that facilitates and, and gives a wink and a nudge to uh, behavior like this. So, I, what I, I, I we've seen a lot of coverage, and I've written you know a couple of pieces on this. Yeah, Hollywood is giant hypocrites. Mm-hmm. Yes, they deserve to get you know beat over the head metaphorically over this. Um, they deserve to be held accountable. Uh, the degree to which they I expose this um, morally upside down perspective, mm-hmm. um, the arrogance, oh, you know, all that stuff, it's all worth writing about. And you get plenty of that written in conservative media. The question is okay, having said that, now what? Yeah. Um, and in a sense, I don't think that's a sufficient response. I don't think um, 
John Derbyshire, formerly of National Review, used to say pop culture is filth, uh-huh. uh, and then kind of you know dismissed and poo-pooed the whole thing. Well. I'm not of that mindset. In fact, I have quite a few differences with John Derbyshire. <laughs> um, but one of the points is that, like, well, actually, I kind of like the Marvel movies. I like taking my sons to yeah, see yeah. them. I like the Star Wars movies, and we can get into that in a minute or two. Um, I don't want to have to completely close myself off to every big movie and every TV. Now, um, <clears throat> one of my uh, side projects that's been a bit on hiatus for a while, but we hope to start, start is uh, a pop culture podcast with Mickey White. Yeah. Creatively called the Jim and Mickey Show. Um, <laughs> T-Jams. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, T-Jams. Which, you know, everyone was like, oh, is that something? Is that like a fungus or something? Is that some sort of terrible thing? Yeah. But um, we wanted to do a show that was discussing pop culture mm-hmm. that would kind of avoid that. And I'm sure you've experienced this. You're watching a sitcom. You're laughing. You're having fun. And all of a sudden, it's like, <laughs> yeah, unlike Mike Pence. That's you know, right. And it's this out of nowhere... Hey, we're not Republican, you know, yeah. kind of uh, sucker punches. Uh, yeah. John Nolte calls them exactly. That. It's it, it very often feels shoehorned in. It does mm-hmm. not feel uh, natural to the characters. It's it, it, virtue signaling in the very worst set, mm-hmm. in the very worst way. Um, and we just wanted to do a show in which you could be conservative and you would not feel like out of nowhere, bam, bam. you're going to. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't primarily about politics. It was primarily about pop mm. culture and all kinds of stuff. We had a lot of fun at the expense of Gwyneth Paltrow and Goop <laughs> uh, and things like that. But uh, they call that a target-rich environment. I think, exactly. So. Yes. But it was one of those things like, hey, conservatives watch movies too, and yeah. watch TVs too, and, and listen to pop music too. And if you look carefully, I think you can find a lot of stuff that you could really enjoy and not find contrary to your values or, or looking down on you or attacking you or stuff like that. I think every few years there's a symposium, there's a speech, there's an article, there's a moment. They go, we need more conservatives in Hollywood because then they can get their messages out and not in a heavy-handed way, but sort yeah. of gentle themes about independence and, and capitalism and, and the strength of, you know, mm-hmm. of things that we care about. And then it never happens. Yeah. And you see more and more of the sucker punches like we talked about. Is there ever going to be a moment where conservatives get into the media? I mean, I feel like the barrier to entry is much lower now. The technology is mm-hmm. better. You can you can have a YouTube channel with no money yeah. and have a difference. I mean, Candace Owens was here yesterday. She's got thousands and thousands of subscribers sending her message. Why couldn't you make a, like a wacky, late-night-esque show? I mean... Where is that? Why is that not happening? A bunch of folks, uh, including my friend Tony Katz, uh, attempted to do things like that. Uh-huh. My, my theory looking at what conservatives do, uh, this is after attending lots of conservative blogger conferences and things like that, mm-hmm. almost anything that has this low-cost barrier to entry, conservatives can do pretty well. Yeah. Like there's certainly a fine programs like yours, radio, YouTube channels, um, obviously web writing, blogs, um, you know, fine magazines like National Review, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but however, you know, if you want to make a movie like The Avengers, you need a couple hundred millions lying around, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, for special effects and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Not the sort of thing that you can just get together some guys in your garage and say, hey guys, yeah. you know, like you can do uh, a, a small scale human drama and mm-hmm. people have done, you know, fine pieces like that. Um, but let's face it, we, we are attuned to, you know, there's a, there's a room and there's a, there's a place in the world for hum, small scale human dramas and I think some of my favorites of all time have been that but on the other hand if you're going to shell out money to go to the movie theater get a sitter if you're you know not going to see a, a kid's movie um, the popcorn all that, that's an investment I, you, know, you want to be blown away you want to go to Hogwarts with Harry Potter you want to go to a Galaxy Far but you want something amazing for your entertainment dollar and that means you know that requires money that's something I think conservatives until there is a conservative film studio that wants to finance projects like that. You're not going to get that. And it's also worth noting, the problem is once you say, we're doing a conservative version of The Tonight Show, uh-huh. it usually means an unfunny, heavy-handed right. <laughs> version yeah. of The Tonight Show. Yeah, it's a shame. I really, you mentioned Star Wars before. We've got the Game of Thrones creators are going to join a new Star Wars Skywalker-free saga. Mm-hmm. Ryan Johnson, the, the Last Jedi director, is doing the same. A solo movie's coming out. Um, there may be an Obi-Wan movie. I don't know if that's a, it's sort of mm-hmm. certain yet, but... Too much. I mean, I, you know, what is a Star Wars movie without a Skywalker, or even a Ren or a Finn? Really fair question. Um, I, it's one of those things. Like, I, I, so uh, I became a dad in 2007. So mm-hmm. I guess the age of my uh, my sons. They everything that I, they're into that I was into as a kid. They get a ton of toys. I have no problem buying. They get a ton of what? They toys? get a ton of toys. Okay. Oh, and merchandise. <laughs> That's and the stuff. secret for the kids. Yeah. You know, like Star Wars, uh-huh. superheroes. I collect right. comics, all that kind of stuff. They get into something that I wasn't into as a kid, like Pokemon. <laughs> nah, I don't know. If, I don't know if we can afford that. I don't know What's if your get... allowance looking like? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the thing is, on the one hand, it is wonderful to have. Like, I, I don't mind some of this '80s nostalgia. It's wonderful to see mm-hmm. things I loved when I was a kid 
through the eyes of my uh, my children. Like you know, the, when their minds are blown, that Vader is Luke's father. <laughs> but spoiler alert for anyone who's listening. That's I hope right. you know. Um, and, and so on the one hand, it is great. On the other hand, I don't think they realize. You know, uh, let's see. So I'm around five or six when Empire Strike comes. Empire Strikes Back comes out. Hans and Carbonite, uh-huh. my favorite character, and I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and Christian, I got to wait three years to know what's going to happen. <laughs> right? But that's you know, ugh, my Return of the uh-huh. Jedi. I, you know, so my my uh, my dear mother was kind enough to get me to see tickets to see Return of the Jedi the day it opened, May twenty fifth, nineteen eighty three. Mm-hmm. Big day in my childhood, as you can tell. <laughs> Apparently, and I got to see Return uh-huh. of the Jedi before everybody else at school did. Yeah. and I was just, like, oh, I know. And so I remember now. As an older man, I do see that, okay, the, the Ewoks do seem like little merchandising uh, <laughs> uh, devices running around. Poor and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, exactly. But, uh, but that sense of... Uh, and I'm recognizing that for my kids, there's going to be a Star Wars movie every year. Yeah. Uh, you know, every year, and conceivably, like, so we just had Last Jedi around Christmas time. Solo's coming out in May, May yeah. right? You know, um, now the, the one thing gives me a glimmer of hope that they will not get watered down and that they will not eventually turn into ah God, here we go more lightsaber fights more spaceships mm-hmm. well, you know, um, Marvel's done a pretty good job of taking what could have been ah oh, here comes another superhero movie and finding different styles and different genres Ant-Man's a little funnier yeah Doctor, um, Doctor Strange just has a different vibe to yeah, it. You know, Black Panther apparently is very different so. exactly so if, if they can do that with the Star Wars movies and give mm-hmm. each one kind of a different you know have we really seen a spy story yeah. in the Star Wars world have we really seen a um, uh, maybe a more comedic mm-hmm. uh, you know thing or something like that um, The Godfather with Jabba the Hutt in the Star Wars <laughs> you can imagine scenarios and ideas they yeah. could go with that could be kind of fun and interesting okay. to see um you know, hope, hopefully that will be the case. Yeah, you're giving me a glimmer of hope. So. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> a new hope. If you That's like. right. Yeah. Uh, talk about being a dad with kids, going to the movies. Um, is it difficult to sort of know what's appropriate? Do you find that there's enough content out there for you? What, what, any, any sort of tips for sort of fellow fathers? Sure. There are a lot of things I'm comfortable with my kids watching with me. Uh, so, and particularly if we're watching at home, we can pause. Mm-hmm. We can talk about something if something is, you know, too scary or yeah. too intense or something like that. Um, I'm much more nervous about them watching something with me not around. Mm-hmm. Like, probably a good example. Um, a couple years ago, I took my kid. I started watching uh, football games with my older son. He really got into it and stuff. But there was a, tra- a commercial for American Sniper mm-hmm. with uh, uh, Bradley Cooper, and the trailer had the scene where he's. I don't know how realistic the scene was, but he was on the phone talking to his wife at home. She's pregnant. She's got a baby. And they come under attack. Mm-hmm. And he drops the phone and all that stuff. And I, my son is probably like, I don't know, six or seven at that age. I could just see, like, mm-hmm. like that was a little intense for, for yeah. that. Because obviously he wanted to know what happened and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it is a bit of a judgment call. Sometimes you're going to be surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, Alexander and the Terrible No Good, Very Bad Day. They turn into a live-action movie. Um, and, you know, it's like, you know, the dad gets kicked by a kangaroo. Like, this is mostly slapstick comedy, yeah. but my younger son, who's probably about five or six around then, um, got really upset by it. And, you know, I think he had, and to him, like, the dad really was getting kicked by a kangaroo, yeah. and it was, it was you know, frightening and scary. The and slapstick stuff. was lost. Yes, it, it was kind of, I remember him saying, it was just so bad. <laughs> and, like, we're laughing at Alexander for having this terrible bad day. Like, <laughs> we're all relating. We've all had that. Uh-huh. My younger son probably hadn't had that kind of a day. And yeah. for him, it really was that all these terrible things are happening. So, um, you know, but I, I've largely managed it, and I've, I've told them many times that there's stuff that they want to see, that they hear kids talking about or something like that. Yeah. I'm fine if they want to watch it with me. Well, first, okay. I'll, I'll, also, most of these movies, I'll go see them myself before mm-hmm. that. Um, and for my younger son, for example, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, as far as he's concerned, it's about Baby Groot. And then some <laughs> grown-ups do some stuff. But mostly it's a movie about sure. Baby Groot. So uh, I think they appreciate it on their level while I'm enjoying it. On, on gotcha. Uh, the last question, this is something that I hear a lot. Andrew Clavin was here last year directly talked about it sort of what can conservatives do with pop culture you don't want to say it's filth because I think you're disengaging from the mm-hmm. culture war and that's an, I don't think that's helpful in a way but what can what can conservatives do if they're fed up with the sucker punches if they're mm-hmm. if they want more right of center content if they don't want the lecture what are some yeah. are there anything is there any proactive steps that they could take <laughs> you know, probably first thing is if you find you know, first of all look, the blockbuster is going to be fine oh am I coming up yes okay I need to like you all right. I'm sorry it's okay. Reach out beyond your boundaries. Look for the good stuff and okay. tout it when it happens. Help every good film you can find. All right. All right. Thank Appreciate you, Jim. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you, by the way. All righty. 
Well, thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out HollywoodandToto.com for both the show notes and, of course, the latest entertainment news. Please follow me at Twitter at Hollywood and Toto. And we'd love it if you leave a podcast review over at iTunes. See you next week. 